We want to welcome you to today's session on workers' compensation. My name is Sarah Curtis and I'm a training consultant in our loss control department here at Public Entity Partners. My co-host for this session is Debbie Yeager, our member services representative for West Tennessee. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today and hope that we are able to clarify a few key components of the workers' compensation process and answer any additional questions you might have. Our goal for this session is twofold. First, we want everyone to understand that workers' compensation is statutory and a process that must be followed. We will review this process with you so that you can be confident that your current workers' compensation program is both thorough and efficient. Our second objective is to ensure that you, as our member, know that we have the tools and resources to help you through this process. Later, Debbie will also review some of the available resources that can help you in creating a safe work environment for your employees to not only help you reduce workers' compensation claims, but also assist you in developing a culture of safety that both you and your employees can feel proud of. Let's first look at the goal of workers' compensation. Workers' compensation laws and processes are really aimed to get the injured or ill worker back to work safely. We want them to recover as quickly as possible, not only because their absence hurts the organization, but it also hurts the individual. And we're able to do this through a process that allows for making claims decisions that are timely and accurate and provide prompt payment of benefits. We'll get into this process soon, but let's start by looking at the history of workers' compensation so we can understand how it is that we got here. While some forms of workers' compensation date back hundreds of years ago, in the United States, it was primarily a response to the impact of the Industrial Revolution. Factories that were built during the Industrial Revolution had many hazards. Obviously, machines caused accidents, but sickness was really one of the most common threats to workers' health, with people being overworked, with the spread of contagious diseases in enclosed spaces, or the hazardous conditions that we saw within the mining industry. So with these work-related injuries skyrocketing, the courts were really the only place workers could go to receive compensation. And this was an uphill battle because they could only collect compensation if employers could not prove things like contributory negligence or that a coworker caused the employee's injury or illness. And even if the employer couldn't prove these things, most employees did not have the means to file a lawsuit. So in 1911, Wisconsin was the first state to pass an all-inclusive workers' compensation policy. It took until 1948 for every state to pass their own workers' comp legislation. This legislation provided a no-fault benefit for employees who were injured on the job. In return, workers gave up the right to sue their employers for work-related injuries or illnesses. Workers' compensation provides medical benefits and can also compensate for lost wages in some cases. The state of Tennessee passed workers' compensation legislation in 1919, but a few years ago decided to examine the current legislation and gather feedback from employers and employees on how the current process was working in the real world. And so as a result, there were several reforms made that took effect in 2014. One of the key findings of the study that was conducted was the need for clarification of the definition of an injury to reduce the confusion for both employers and employees. The reform also created a program to assist self-represented employees and employers, so those not represented by an attorney, as they navigate the workers' compensation claims process. While many changes happened as a result of the reform in 2014, What's important for our members to know is that no amount of reform will improve the process if employers and employees have the attitude that it is an entitlement or just something to protect the organization. So just as you don't want employees who look for opportunities to take advantage of the workers' compensation program in bad faith, you as an employer shouldn't view workers' compensation as simply the cost of doing business. A better approach is for employees to know that employers are doing everything they can to provide safe working conditions, but that if an accident or an illness does happen, there is a process to be followed, and that while it may not be perfect, it is in the best interest of all parties involved. 
Conversely, when employees know that their employer cares about creating safe work conditions for them and helping them through the workers' compensation process should an injury occur, then they should want to do their part to prevent accidents as well. Ultimately, safety needs to be a partnership between the employer and the employees with the goal of everyone to be the well-being of their fellow co-workers. So just to review, workers' compensation helps employees through providing a no-fault system, providing for potentially lifetime medical benefits should that need arise, and can compensate for some lost wages. Workers' compensation also helps employers by establishing an orderly process to follow for all work-related injuries or illnesses, and it is the exclusive remedy for employees hurt at work. So again, this means that in exchange for this defined benefit that they receive under workers' compensation, injured employees give up the right to sue their employers for work-related illnesses and injuries. Now let's take a look at the specific workers' compensation laws in the state of Tennessee and the processes that we are required to follow. So as we previously mentioned, workers' compensation is statutory, and it's important that we follow the process that the law lays out for us. If we don't, then employees might not get the medical care that they need, um, or it could result in the denial of workers' compensation benefits. And ultimately, we want to make sure that the injured worker is taken care of and that they receive their benefits so that they are able to get back to work as soon as possible. So by following this process, it reduces the confusion and the stress that both the employee and the employer can experience. So I mentioned earlier that the definition of a compensable injury was clarified and took effect in 2014. So let's look at that definition. So a work-related injury is an event that can be at least 50% attributed to work. So an injury is compensable if it arises primarily out of and in the course and scope of employment when all other possible causes are considered. And it must show by a preponderance of evidence that the employment contributed to more than 50% in causing the injury or the illness. And this will be determined by a treating physician. There are some exclusions um, that would prevent compensation uh, due to an injury or an illness or death at work um, pursuant to the statute. So this would be things like willful misconduct on the part of the employee, um, a self-inflicted injury, uh, potentially if an employee is intoxicated at work, uh, the willful failure uh, to use a safety device or refusing to perform a duty that's required by law, uh, by TOSHA, or the voluntary participation in recreational activities. Now, there are some exceptions here as well, and I would encourage you uh, to look at those. We have the TCA code where you could look those up there, but this is going to have to do uh, with things like if participation was required by the employer or if the employer received a direct benefit for the employee participating in this. Um, so please take a look at those. If you have any questions, please reach out to us so that we are able to look at each situation um, and determine uh, what we think might potentially be an exception there. Most all of us are aware that it's illegal um, for any party to intentionally defraud another party, and this is the same with workers' compensation. Um, but this does not just apply to the employee or the employer. There are uh, third parties involved uh, who could also be guilty of fraud. For example, insurance adjusters who provide uh, benefits that the worker's not supposed to receive attorneys who might try to influence um, providers to submit medical opinions to benefit their clients, um, medical providers who send bills to the insurance company for services that they did not provide. That's the one we're probably the most familiar with. 
um, but also insurance agents who sell workers' compensation insurance policies uh, to employers and they accept payment for those premiums, but they never notify a carrier. So in other words, no policy is ever actually written. This did happen in the state of Tennessee where two women were indicted on money laundering um, and insurance fraud charges. Uh, as well as a few other charges for conspiring to create fake, or, fake workers' compensation policies and then pocketing uh, those premium payments. It's important to note that the Bureau of Workers' Compensation does not investigate these claims. You need to report those to the insurance carrier or third-party administrator, and reports can also be made to the local district attorney general. So now let's talk a little bit about workers' compensation benefits. Medical benefits are provided. Obviously, they must be from a compensable injury or illness, and we talked about the definition of compensable. Uh, medical is covered at 100%. The Bureau of Workers' Compensation did adopt the Work Loss Data Institute's ODG guidelines. These are a best practice. They do not have to be used uh, by the treating physician, but they do give the doctor guidelines for normal treatment for common injuries. Um, and the goal of this is to get the patient the treatment um, that has proven outcomes. There is also uh, the benefit of replacement for lost wages. So an employee who has suffered a compensable workplace injury or an illness um, and may have been taken off work or assigned light duty by an authorized physician, uh, they may be entitled to receive these lost wage benefits. This will be determined by the treating physician who will determine if the employee has suffered a temporary or permanent disability and whether it is partial or total. You can read all about these on the Bureau of Workers' Compensation's website. What's important to know is that the treating physician will determine that and that information will be used to calculate benefits as they relate to wages. So if you want to learn more about um, those calculations, you can find those on uh, the Bureau's website um, on the state of Tennessee's website. Impairment ratings are also determined um, by a physician um, and so it's important to know that this is not something that you have to determine. There are also death benefits for the surviving dependents um, should a compensable workplace injury or illness um, result in the death of a covered employee. Uh, so you can see here if there were no dependents, $20,000 is paid to the estate. If there is a surviving spouse and no dependent children, 50% uh, of the average weekly wages shall be paid to the surviving spouse. This would be subject to the maximum weekly benefit that's updated annually. There's a surviving spouse and one or more dependent children, 66 and two thirds percentage shall be paid to the surviving spouse for the benefit of them and their children. There's also a burial expense of $10,000 um, for a death occurring after May 19th of 2017. So that covers an overview of the benefits, but I now wanna turn it over to Debbie to discuss the process that must be followed for a timely payout of these benefits from the claims. Thank you, Sarah. I am Debbie Yeager, the West Tennessee Member Services Representative for Public Entity Partners. We truly appreciate you participating in our session and hopefully you will be able to take this information that we've shared today back to your cities and entities to help develop or even enhance your current workers' compensation and safety programs. I'm glad to be able to share some additional information with y'all. I do want to reiterate what Sarah shared with us earlier about creating a safety culture within your organization 
it is extremely important and it's, it is imperative that your organization has a solid and effective workers comp and safety program in place and a safe working environment for your employees. The more we focus on these programs, the more likelihood keeping your employees safe from those work-related injuries and illnesses. In return, it will also help with reducing and preventing those workers' compensation claims down the road. It's a win-win situation for both the employee and the member. The goal is at the end of the day to create a safe working environment and that safety culture within your organization so we all return home safely to our families. I want to spend some time with you and discuss the next few sections of the presentation talking about the medical oversight, uh, the, the claim reporting process, employees returning back to work, and some of the additional resources including our loss control guidelines available to help assist you as you work on developing um, your workers' compensation and safety programs for your organization. The first thing I'd like to talk about is on the medical oversight. This is a requirement by Tennessee state law to have medical oversight for workers' compensation, and you achieve this through your panel of physicians. This is an extremely important process to meet statutory obligation. An employer is required to extend a panel of physicians consist consisting of at least three physicians or facilities within the employee's local community, not associated in practice or the same medical group, who will treat injured and ill employees as a result of a work-related injury or incident. You may have more than three physicians on your panel, but it's not required. You can list the local ER as your fourth option and note that it is to be used for true emergencies and after-hour injuries only. You can have a second panel for after-hours with the ER on the panel. With urgent care clinics such as Fast Pace, a family nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant can be used as long as there is a supervising medical director with the clinic. The workers' compensation statute now requires the medical director's name and the clinic name to be listed on the panel, but the employee can see the family nurse practitioner or the physician assistant as long as there is a supervising medical director on staff. As I mentioned earlier, you may have more than three physicians on your panel, but not required. Some of the larger members may have more than three physicians listed on their panel due to more options and more medical providers available. In contrast, many of our members are located in small and rural communities and may have limited access to medical providers and may not have three different practices to work within their local community to establish that panel. In that situation, an employer may look outside their local communities and reach out to other surrounding towns and areas to find qualified physicians for their panel. Once that panel is established and approved and you're comfortable with it, then the Form C-42 is completed. You are required to use the Tennessee State Form C-42, the employee's choice of physicians. An employer cannot create their own form. This form is located on the state website at Tennessee.gov under the Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development. The employee's choice of physicians, Form C-42, is required to be extended to the employee as soon as possible once the employer is aware of the injury or illness and no later than three business days. To be covered by workers' compensation, employees must use this panel. They cannot use their own family physician unless they are on the panel and approved by that city. Once the panel is offered, the employee may select an authorized treating physician from that panel and sign the form. The employer shall maintain the original ex executed document with the employee receiving a copy. At times, an injured and ill employee may need emergency care. In that situation, if emergency treatment is needed or if the injury occurs maybe after normal business hours, on the weekends, or during holidays, an employee can always bypass the panel and go directly to the emergency room. The employer shall offer the employee's choice of physician panel once the employee reaches a stable condition and is otherwise able to select an authorized training physician. Often at times, with my experience, the ER physician will make a referral or suggest to the employee to see their own personal family physician for a follow-up visit. The reason why this happens at times is that ER doctors are contracted by the hospital for short periods of time and do not understand the workers' compensation process. 
Just make sure your employees understand the workers' compensation process, that they are aware that they are required to use the approved panel of physicians for treatment to be covered under workers' compensation. A good way to communicate this process is to build it into your new employee orientation program or during safety training that you conduct or whatever methods of communication you may have available. The next section we're going to talk about is the panel of physician selection process. When selecting physicians for your panel, this process should be very carefully considered and taken very seriously. Selecting the right physician is a key factor in your workers' compensation program and can have a tremendous impact on your desired outcome based on the level of quality care provided to your employee, the timeliness of your employee receiving that medical treatment, returning the employee back to work safely with or without restrictions, and then the communication process. It is extremely important to be able to establish a strong and effective relationship with your panel physicians to ensure they are communicating with you ongoing regarding the employee's medical status, any progress updates, return to work status, and any issues they may be having during their injury. They should also be able to work closely with your claims department and their case management team. Employers can select any independent reputable physician in the area who will treat employees as a result of a work-related injury or illness. Again, physicians can't be associated in practice. Physicians selected under panel should be competent, responsive, meeting the employee's needs as far as initial medical treatment received and the quality of care, and working with you closely to schedule appointments for your employees as quickly as possible, and making sure there's a strong communication line open. And they also must be able to complete paperwork in a timely manner. There is going to be a lot of paperwork involved and they must be willing to accept this responsibility. And they must understand the workers' compensation process and comply with the workers' compensation statutory requirements. They must be able to competently assess the employee's injury and communicate with the employee regarding the employee's ability to perform the essential job functions of their job, especially to the physical demands of their position. I just wanted to mention here that legislative passed laws allowing employees and third parties, such as the claims adjusters, to communicate with the um, authorized treating physicians about the employee's medical treatment, having access to medical records, and the authorized treating physician knows you are able to do that. We all have to work closely together, stay in contact with one another, making sure we are getting the employee back to work as soon as possible and when it is safe to do so. Prior to selecting your panel of physicians, talk with other organizations and companies in your area and communities for references and input, who they use and their satisfaction levels. Have they experienced any issues working with the medical provider? Did their employees receive good quality care? Did the medical provider communicate well with the employer? This is a great way to determine the physicians you want to select to be on your panel and it is imperative you build and establish a strong working relationship with your panel, building that level of trust and level of comfort. You need to talk with physicians before adding them to your panel and make sure they will work with workers' compensation. Just don't place um, the physician on the panel without talking to them. Not all medical providers will treat work-related injuries or incidents. Ongoing communication with the authorized treating physician is important. There are no specific guidelines that I'm aware of, but I believe it is a good practice to stay in touch with your panel, at least annually to stay in touch with them, make sure they are still practicing or have not moved out of the area, or if you have not used them in a long time. This may be the case, especially with smaller members that may not have many workers' compensation claims and do not use the medical providers often. And I also want to make sure, um, you also want to make sure the current physicians want to remain on your panel annually. The next thing we want to talk about is the um, panel of physicians role. What is the role of the panel of physicians? Why do we use them and what do they do for us? When selecting the um, doctors for your panel, be mindful that this physician will be the gatekeeper for treatment of the employee and the management of the workers' compensation claim. They will work closely with the injured employee, providing quality medical care, determine when the employee may return to work with or without restrictions, any medications necessary, and the duration of the medications, if needed, and whether the employee should be referred to a specialist. 
You will need to notify the selected panel, physicians, or clinics that any specialist referrals are required to go through the employer and through or through public entity partners. If you receive a request for a specialist referral, please notify the claims department immediately as they will possibly need to provide a specialist panel within three business days. I want to add another quick note before, going, before we go to the claim um, reporting process. Well-written and updated job descriptions are essential. When working with your panel of physicians and with the injured employees, it is imperative that the authorized treating physician has a validated, updated current job description reflecting the essential functions of the employee's job and outlining the physical demands of the job, which may include and address items such as lifting, carrying, climbing, bending, sitting. Um, this will assist the authorized treating physician to determine what the employee's limitations may, if any, when they return to work. If they return to work full duty, limitations, or will they be off for a, a period of time? So again, it is imperative. Employees need well-written, updated current job descriptions. So often when I visit with members, they do not have job descriptions or, they, or they're not updated reflecting the current job responsibilities and physical demands. It is important to have job descriptions not only for your uh, authorized training physicians as they treat injured employees, but for job training and post-offer physicals. So even before the employee begins work, you can determine if they can meet the essential functions of the job and the physical demands associated with that job. This helps hire the right people for the right jobs and helps with preventing injuries from occurring down the road. It is just best practice. The next area I would like to spend some time discussing is on the claim reporting process. Unfortunately, employee injuries do happen and we must be aware of what to do when that happens. First, the employer or member should report the injury as soon as it has been reported to you and you are aware of the injury or illness. Then you would, then you would need to notify our claims department immediately so they can go ahead and set up the file and assign an adjuster to oversee their claim and assist as needed. I want to point out, never refuse to accept an employee's notice of injury. Go ahead and take all the information, complete the first report of injury, and forward to our claims department. Let them review the claim and determine the next steps involved. You should never be the one to determine if the employee's injury is work-related or not. And if you believe it is not work-related, let our claims department manage the claim and again direct you on the status of that claim as they complete their process. As we continue to talk about the workers' compensation process further, there are posting requirements that the employers have to comply with for workers' compensation. It is required by Tennessee state law for employers to post a visible notice instructing employees how to report work-related injuries. This posting notice provides information and direction for both the employee and for the employer on what to do if an injury should occur. It provides the contact information for the employee, who to reach out to, including the name and title of the employer representative to be notified in the event of a work-related injury, and an alternative representative if the main contact is unavailable. The form provides the phone number and address as well for the employer. A copy of this notice can be found on the Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development's website. You can download the actual form and complete it. If you have different um, departments located in different places, such as the police department, fire department, city hall, the notice should be posted conspicuously in each location. You can post in break rooms or around Tom clocks, maybe bulletin boards where you post all OSHA information, federal and state mandatory postings, such as wage and hour, um, the drug-free workplace, Title VI, and other pertinent information. I would strongly recommend if your cities have a new employee orientation program, I would suggest that you build into your new employee orientation program a workers compensation topic section outlining some of the information we have shared today and with the workers compensation reporting requirements, point of contact, and direct them to this posting. Again, this posting notice is required, so make sure if you do not have it posted, go to the website, pull the form off, and complete it. Okay, we're going to going to spend a few minutes talking about reporting an injury or illness. Both the employee and employer have responsibilities when reporting work-related injury, injuries or illnesses. So if, you, if an employee should have an injury due to a work-related accident, 
and employees should report a work-related injury as soon as possible to their supervisor. Make sure your supervisors are well trained on the reporting process. In addition, it is always a good practice for your supervisors to know how to conduct an employee accident or incident investigation. Collect as much information and facts surrounding the injury, how, when, where, if the injury was caused due to, due to an unsafe working condition, act immediately, making the work area safe um, to prevent other work-related injuries from occurring. We have accident investigation forms available on our website. Here I'd like to point out it's a good idea or practice to have witness statements if all possible. Having good supporting documentation is imperative. The employee shall, shall select a training position from the panel provided by your employer. This is the form C42. This is the panel of physicians you have established for your city and the injured employee will select their authorized training physician from this panel. This notice shall be signed by the employee. However, if the employee is unable to sign, they can have another person authorize the sign on the employee's behalf or by any one or more of the employee's dependents if the accident resulted in death to the employee. As we, as we, discuss, um, as we discuss the employer's responsibilities, First, you will need to complete a first report of injury, Form C-20. I will discuss this process in just a few minutes. Provide injured employees the Form C-42 as soon as possible. This is a panel of physicians, employer's choice of physicians I just discussed earlier. Please keep in mind in an, emer in an emergency situation, employees need to go directly to the emergency room and you can provide the, the Form C-42 once the employee's injury is stabilized. Don't worry about the paperwork up front. Um, just make sure the employee receives the necessary medical treatment if needed and is stabilized. After an employee is stabilized, then you can meet with that employee and have them complete the C42 form as soon as possible. This form needs to be completed within three business days and you need to report all known or reported accidents and injuries to Public Entity Partners Claims Department as soon as possible. The next area we are going to spend some time discussing is the actual first report of injury. This is a C20 form. It is required to be completed by the employer once a work-related injury or illness is reported by the employee. An employer must accept any notice of a claim for workers' compensation benefits from any employee or employee's representative alleging an injury. Again, I will stress, never refuse an employee's report of injury or illness. Go ahead, obtain all the information from the employee, and complete the Form C-20. You will need to forward this report to our claims department, and at that point, they will, they will review the information and determine the next steps in the process. Report all injuries. Don't pick and choose. It is a good practice for employees to be informed to report all injuries, no matter how minor they may be. Have injuries documented just in case down the road the employee does begin to experience issues. Um, sometimes it may take a few days to realize when an incident has caused an injury and damage and medical treatment is needed. Notify the claims department and they will set up a notification only file. Keep in mind when reporting injuries and illnesses, this is not an admission of liability or, or compensability. You will need to complete the, C4, the C20 form with as much information as possible. After your appointment and visit with that employee and you gather and collect all the information and all the facts surrounding his or her injury or illness, you will then at that point transfer all that information onto the form. I want to point out here, try to complete as many of the fields on the form as you can. In the description area, be as specific as you can when describing the body part affected. You do not have to write a novel, but be as specific as you can with regards to the injury. Providing information on the body part Exact, exact location, right or left side, and the cause of injury. For example, if employee twisted ankle, you would write employees walking down the stairs at City Hall slipped on wet surface and twisted left ankle. That is all the information you need to report in that area. Once the claims department receives the first report of injury that you submitted, they will review the information and assign an adjuster to the claim. And at that point, they will capture more detailed information as needed during their process. And when you submit the first report of injury, you will also attach any supporting documentation such as, such as medical notes you may have received from the authorized treating physician or the ER if they had gone and received medical treatment, any investigation reports, witness statements, 
police reports, and any other pieces of information that may be beneficial surrounding the injury. This helps the claim department as a substantive claim file. Always make sure you provide your claims department and claims adjuster with any updated information regarding your employee documentation regarding the employee ongoing. The claims adjuster will be in constant contact with the employee, but it's always good practice to send the information anyway. I also want to mention as a member, you have the ability to report all employee work-related injuries and illnesses to our claims department through our member portal online claim system. You can also report injuries by fax, email, or by phone to our claims department. If you should need access to our member portal system to file claims online, reach out to your member service representative for your area and they will be more than glad to assist you. You may have an agent that already performs this function for you, but if not, please let us know. And you also have access to our claims analytics system and have the ability to review your workers' compensation claims ongoing, track trends, and focus on any identified problem areas when working with your safety programs and safety committees, which we will talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, some of the workers' compensation claim forms that can be located on our website, um, it's a temporary pharmacy first field card, workers' compensation wage statement, and then of course the accident investigation reports are also on our um, website. Okay, the next section is going to, be, going to be talking about returning to work, transitional duty. When an employee has been hurt due to a work-related accident and is unable to return to their initial job, our goal is to get them back to work as soon as possible, but not until they are ready and released by their um, authorized training physician, with or without restrictions. If they can perform light duty work, then at that point we can look at options, including light duty or transitional duty positions. When discussing transitional duty or light duty programs, not every organization entity may have the ability to have a transitional or light duty program. However, if you can develop a transitional light duty program within your city, with my experience, I have found that bringing the employee back to work on a light duty assignment within the work restrictions has a very positive outcome for both the employee and the employer. When looking at possible positions, the light duty position should be productive to both the employee and the city. I have found bringing the employee back to work within the work restrictions makes the employee feel valued. The longer the employee stays off work, it becomes more difficult to get them back to work. When an employee injury and illness occurs and the treating physician places the employee off from work for a period of time, it is extremely important you stay in touch with that employee the treating physician and the claims department and the adjuster assigned to that claim. It is also extremely important that the supervisor of the employee stay in contact with the employee as much as possible, even if they just want to say hi and we miss you, um, we, or, or we hope you have a speedy recovery. So often in my experience when an employee is off from work for a period of time, they feel neglected or even guilty for being injured or not being valued. However, with all this said, the employer does not have to accept the employee back to work until the employee is fully recovered and released to full duty without restrictions by the authorized treating physician. This is ultimately your decision. The employer has no legal obligation or duty to create work or a position so that the employee can return back to work. If you do allow the employee to return to work on a light duty status, Make sure the transitional return to work is a short-term or temporary modification of work assignments that allows the employee to return to work while complying with all restrictions assigned by the authorized treating physician. Again, I would point out here, it's, it's imperative that you have a well-established relationship with your panel and communication lines are open and effective. You want to make sure both you and the authorized treating physician are both in agreement that the employee is able to to perform the, tra the transitional duty being offered and assigned. When should, you, when should you consider a light duty assignment? Like I said earlier, light duty assignment should be considered when it can be beneficial for both to you and the employer. If a limited light duty position is, is available, job functions should be closely reviewed by the authorized treating physician to make sure the employee can perform those duties without further injury. It does not have to be an established position but should only be assigned if the work is productive to both the employee and the entity. Extremely important that the employee understands the work assignment is or the light duty position is temporary and not a, per, a permanent position. 
Employers should evaluate the assignment every 15 to 20 days and again, work very closely with your authorized trading position. I would like to add here too, not only communication is important with the employee and, the, uh, and with the authorized trading physician, but it is also very important that the supervisor is, is involved with this process as well. The supervisor needs to be on the same page and be supportive with the light duty assignment and the desired outcome. When we talk about building a safety culture, on-the-job safety and workers' compensation must be a cultural partnership instilled by the leadership of the organization and by the commitment of its employees. A good safety culture can be promoted by your leadership team personally invested with a commitment to safety and the safety of others, realistic practices for identifying exposure risks and preventing and reducing those risks and by implementing solid and effective safety programs, practices, and policies, and reevaluating those safety programs and practices is ongoing, overall ensuring a safe work environment for all employees. Having the key staff on your team is essential in the, in the success of managing your workers' compensation program. Many employers or members that are small may not have one designated person for risk management, and often risk management takes second priority. Some managers perform multiple roles, especially in those smaller cities. You should have someone on your staff assigned for risk management responsibilities and to coordinate those activities to ensure safety plans and practices are carried out. They do not necessarily have to be the one actually to perform the functions, but making sure the organization is in compliance. Risk management should be each and every manager's responsibility and play a significant role in creating that safe environment and contributing to the, to the success of creating a safety culture. It is a team effort to ensure we create a safe work environment for our employees, identify potential risk exposures within the organization, and to report those issues to the appropriate departments, leadership teams, and to develop solid and effective safety programs, practices, and policies. Your supervisor should be well trained as they, as they do play a key role in risk management and safety. They should understand the organizational safety programs, safety practices, standards, policies, and procedures within their departments. They should ensure their employees are well trained for their jobs, enforce safety practices within their scope of responsibilities, and again contribute to the overall organizational safety culture. Having a safety committee is something we also recommend. Some members may not have the ability or resources to establish safety committees for whatever reasons. It may be by member size, leadership decisions, so forth. But I have found establishing a, a strong and solid safety committee with re representation from all departments can be extremely effective and beneficial for the member for, ser for several reasons. The safety committee can assist with policy development, identifying and reporting unsafe working conditions, with accident reviews, reporting potential risk exposures, developing preventative measures to help with prevention of accidents and injuries within the workplace, and also help reduce the frequency and severity of those accidents and injuries um, throughout the organization. An effective safety committee should have an overall awareness of their safety culture and be part of implementing a strong and solid safety and training program for their city. The next slide is a snapshot of PE Partners um, Risk Library page located on our website at www.pepartners.org where you can find valuable information for several areas. As you can see, under the General Risk Management area, you can find PE Partners Management of Workers' Compensation Program Guidelines that may be useful and, and it provides information on some of the areas we discussed today. There are also checklists. Um, available including a workers' comp self-assessment checklist. This may be helpful as you determine what steps you may need to implement for your city's workers' compensation program. And there's also sample forms that we talked about earlier. Um, here you can find the accident investigation forms and so forth. And as you can tell, there is a variety of additional information you can have access to for your city. So please use these resources as you move forward.
The next slide provides some resources and website links to have access for you to review information, including our PE Partners Loss Control Guidelines, PE Partners Workers' Comp Checklist, and the Tennessee Bureau of Workers' Compensation. If you've not used these resources, I would strongly encourage you to be familiar with them. These um, website links allow you to have, to have access to several pieces of information that can be extremely helpful as you work on your workers' compensation programs and safety programs. The Tennessee Bureau of Workers' Compensation website is another valuable source of information that you have access to, and it may be useful as you are reviewing and developing your um, workers' compensation safety programs. This slide highlights the areas of the employer's rights and responsibilities in a workers' compensation claim and their approach on improving your workers' compensation culture by using a concept of care. We have already covered most of these areas already in our discussion, but I just wanted to make you aware uh, of this resource being available to you. The last few items I'd like to share with you today are some of our value-added services and resources we have available to our members um, that are free resources to utilize and take advantage of for your city as you review, as you review and develop your workers' comp and safety programs. We have several grants available for members to apply for, but I wanted to share the Safety Partners Grant specifically aimed at providing funding to purchase items for employee safety. The Safety Partners Grant provides funding for our members to to purchase safety and loss prevention items or training aimed at reducing work-related injuries and accidents. Examples of eligible items include, but, not, but are not limited to, PPE, bulletproof vests, work zone safety equipment, first aid equipment, footwear, turnout gear, education and training. We do have other grants available you can apply for, including the driver safety grant, property grant, and cybersecurity grant, which all of these will become available later this year. You can go to our website for more detailed information regarding each one of these. We also have several scholarships available annually to allow our members to attend the National PRIMA and the Tennessee PRIMA conferences and the PRIMA Institute. These conferences and programs provide a variety of risk management education and training for our members. We also have the Law Enforcement, Legal and Liability Risk Management Scholarship and the Police Risk Management Scholarship available. Public Entity Partners offers training through the local Government Risk Academy to our members at no added cost. This online educational platform provides self-paced individual training that is accessible 24-7 from any computer with internet access. Users will have access to more than 200 courses. Course categories include general safety, human resources, law enforcement, management, roadway and highway, and transit and fleet operations. A complete list of all these courses offered and registration can be located, located on our website. We also have DVDs available as well for an additional training resource and a complete list of DVDs is located on our website. They can be reserved at no cost by completing the safety training DVD request form on our website and submitting. Um, some of the um, training courses are on back, um, can be, uh, some of them, just to name a few, are, um, are on back safety, first aid, safety audits, accident prevention, slips and falls, PPE, just to name a few. Um, the HR Hero and EHS Hero program is available for our members to enroll in free and provides additional resources for your entity. The HR Hero and EHS Hero is a comprehensive web-based compliance platform that connects you with the resources to make informed decisions. In it, you will find detailed regulatory explanations for Tennessee as well as for federal resources. You also will find a variety of tools to help you with, with tasks such as creating job descriptions, employee HR training and safety programs, sample letters, forms and policies, access to safety data sheets, just to name a few. It also has full trainings with PowerPoint presentations, toolbox talks, and facilitator guides already done for you that you can use. We have our risk Risk and Insurance Symposium scheduled for August 21st through the 23rd, and it will be held at the Franklin Marriott Cool Springs. This three-day in-person educational and networking event will provide attendees with courses aimed at local government risk management and touch on emerging risk exposures. Additional information, including registration, will be on our website soon. I hope you will be able to join us this year. Um, we also have the member portal system. I've kind of went over that earlier. Um, um, today, but um, on a claims analytics system, this allows our members access to review your claims history and losses by each line of coverage 
um, able to track trends and you can identify any problem areas for improvement in safety training. You can review data for the entire city, department specific, by cause or by financial areas. And you can also see your history from the first day of having coverage with PE partners. This is a wonderful program available to our members and if you should need assistance signing up for a member portal, um, please contact your member service representative for your area. The last slide consists of our loss control and member services teams for your area that you can reach out to for support and guidance. I'm Debbie Yeager, your member services representative for West Tennessee. We have um, Callie Westerfield, she's our member services director and also serves as member service representative for Middle Tennessee. Kelly Randell, she's our member services um, for um, representative for East Tennessee. We have Paul Chambliss, um, our loss control consultant for West Tennessee. Bob Lynch, he's our loss control consultant for Middle Tennessee. And we have Michael Foster, um, our loss control consultant for East Tennessee. We are here to help you answer questions and assist you with any of our programs, resources, and services ongoing. So if you need anything, please reach out to us and we'll be more than glad to assist you. We want to thank you again for attending today's session. Our next session will be held in May and will cover open records. As always, please reach out to us if there's anything we can do to assist you and your employees.